2015, a pair of Dutch reporters conducted a social experiment on the streets of Amsterdam. It was only a month after the awful, awful terrorist attacks in Paris that killed 130 people. As you may recall, in the weeks after the attacks, and even now, there was a growing sense of Islamophobia in Europe and North America. And so the two reporters conducted what is known as the Holy Quran experiment. They took a Christian Bible, highlighted half a dozen passages from the Old Testament, some very, very disturbing, troubling passages, and then wrapped the Bible in a book cover of the Holy Quran. They then hit the streets with video cameras and read those disturbing passages from the Quran to individuals to get their reaction. As I said, the passages contain some rather disturbing content. Passages about mass killings, the inferior role of women in society, sexual deviancy, and so forth. The reactions were pretty much what you might expect. How could anyone believe in this? How could anyone follow a religion that was so negative, so aggressive, so violent, oppressive? When they removed that fake cover, the common response was awkwardness. A lot of awkwardness. A lot of uncomfortable laughter. One lady who grew up attending Christian schools even cried when she realized what was going on. Reporters had obviously made their point about judgment, about prejudice. But they also made a powerful point about the content of our Bible foundation of our Judeo-Christian tradition. The truth is that there are plenty of places in our holy book that should make all of us feel awkward. Plenty of passages, especially in the Old Testament, that should make us feel uncomfortable. It is unfortunately a reality of our tradition and history as God's people. Frederick Buechner is a very popular Presbyterian minister, author, theologian. And he doesn't mince words when it comes to the Bible. In his book, Wishful Thinking, Buechner says the following. One way to describe the Bible would be to say that it is a disorderly collection of 60-odd books, which are often tedious, barbaric, obscure, and teem with contradictions and inconsistencies. It is a swarming compost of a book, he says. <laughs> An Irish stew of poetry and propaganda, and law and legalism and myth, history, and hysteria. Wow. Now, to be fair, Beekner does go on to reassure all of us that the Bible is nevertheless still vital for us as God's people. And he offers some practical suggestions on how to read the Bible without tears, as he says. But even so, his description is white eye open. It's not very often that you hear such a respected theologian, or any pastor for that matter, be so frank about the contents of our whole life. Now probably about this point you're wondering why I would be mentioning all of this. 
in church in a sermon on a Sunday morning. But yes, in some places, our Bible is rather tedious. And even harder. Well, there are a number of reasons, actually, to mention all this. First of all, because it is true, and denying the truth doesn't change it. If the scriptures are God's word to us, as our good Presbyterian book of order teaches us, if they are authoritative and inspired by the Holy Spirit, then it seems right to me that every once in a while we should openly acknowledge what's in it. The good, the bad, and the other. The second reason to talk about all of this is because as Christians, as good church-going people, we should have some plan on how to approach the Bible. Some hermeneutic, as they call it, for how to interpret God's word to us, even those troubling parts. Now, we could spend months doing this, months on this topic. But what I really want to focus on this morning is that we are in very good company, very good company when it comes to faithfully, faithfully wrestling with the Bible. God's people have been doing so with great devotion and patience and scholarship for thousands of years. And not only that, but I hope that we all realize that Jesus wrestled with the exact same troubling passages that we do. Jesus never heard of the New Testament. It can be obvious that it needs to be said. He never heard of the New Testament. His Bible, his guide for life, for teaching, for ministry, was the Hebrew Scriptures. What we call the Old Testament. Now again, to fully analyze Jesus' mode for interpreting God's word would take forever. However, the general approach that Jesus took to those troubling passages, the ones that make us cringe to this day, is simply to ignore them. He didn't throw them out. He didn't deny that they were somehow part of God's word just didn't talk about it. Of the 39 books that make up our Old Testament, Jesus never mentions 22 of them. Not a single quote from 22 out of the 39 books that made up his Bible. Jesus never talked once about anything that came from the book of Numbers, Joshua, or Judges, Again, he, he doesn't discard these books. He, he doesn't reject them. He just doesn't have much use for them. Which right away tells us a lot. If you've ever read the book of Joshua or the book of Judges, first of all, God bless you. <laughs> you know that they're pretty much all about people killing other people. Oftentimes with God's blessing. You see, war and violence and God's wrath simply didn't interest Jesus. And we know this because he never talked about it. You know, there's nowhere in the Gospels where, where Jesus is talking about the good old days when the judges reigned and God was just going around smiting. <laughs> he never does that. In fact, Jesus never once, get this, Jesus never once quoted an Old Testament passage when God was punitive. And there were plenty to think of. Jesus clearly had other objectives in mind. Pay attention. If you read the Gospels enough times, you'll see that Jesus' teachings, the 
essentially boil down to the same basic themes. God is good. God is just. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is inclusive. Any Old Testament passage that didn't promote one of those themes, Jesus pretty much ignored. But that's not all. Okay, Jesus also selectively quoted verses to help make his points. He does it dozens of times. I selected just two for today that are most interesting to me. The first is from Luke. Right? We've heard the story before. Jesus is in the synagogue and he is given the book of Isaiah to read. He stands up and he unrolls the scroll. And Luke tells us that he intentionally went to the place where it said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's faith. And he stops and he sits down. It sounds great, right? Jesus intentionally picks this text to talk about, this text about bringing liberty to the captives and release to prisoners. And he says that today this passage has been fulfilled. If you look up Isaiah 61, where Jesus is quoting from, you'll notice that he stops short. In fact, he stops mid-sentence. Okay, the entire last sentence of this passage from Isaiah goes like this. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus could be in the days that are out. Because it didn't apply. Jesus came to proclaim God's favor, not God's vengeance. And so he just didn't bother to complete the rest of the sentence. Another example. Matthew 22. What is the greatest commandment? Again, we've heard this a number of times. Jesus says to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. Now that part about loving your neighbor actually comes from the book of Leviticus. Okay? Which by and large is not a very pleasant It is essentially 27 dense chapters of God's laws and God's rules and then the penalties for breaking God's laws and God's rules. So what does Jesus do with this rather tedious old book, as Beekner would call it? Well, he doesn't flat out ignore it, but he certainly doesn't praise it either. Instead, he, he sifts through all those 27 chapters, all those legalities, to find one golden nugget. In chapter 19, there are 28 negatives. You can look it up. 28 thou shalt not phrases. And then buried right in the middle of all that negativity is this one beautiful line that has the power to change the world. God says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the only time that Jesus ever quotes from the Leviticus. He does so because it furthers his message of inclusivity and justice. These are just two examples of the many that that should give us direction and hope from Jesus. As we continue to faithfully wrestle with God's word, it is important that we get focused on the main things that matter most. The themes that Jesus came back to over and over again in his teachings. 
mercy, goodness, inclusivity. The sad news is that we, as Christians, aren't doing such a good job of this, it seems. All you have to do is look at the news. It's dominated by violence and by hate. Even among those who call themselves Christians. All you have to do is look at the mainline church, which is rapidly in decline. All you have to do is think about all those people who would never step foot in a church because they don't want to hear all the negativity. God's anger, God's judgment of them, God's rule book. People want the golden nuggets. They want good news. And that is what we must focus on. Recently, Pope Francis said the following, in today's world of instant communication and biased media coverage, the message we preach runs a greater risk of being distorted or reduced to some of its secondary aspects. The biggest problem is when the message we preach then seems identified with those secondary aspects which do not convey the heart of Christ's message. Or to put it in secular terms, quote from the legendary Lakers coach Pat Riley, <laughs> says that in life, the main thing is to always keep the main thing your main thing. <laughs> we as Christians have been given direction, we've been given permission by Jesus to focus on the main thing, the heart of the gospel. We see throughout history, we see in too many people's lives that when we don't, when we get distracted, when we allow ourselves to get pulled over into judgment, into retribution, into legalities, we do such harm. We do such harm to the gospel that has power to impact people's lives, that has the power to change this world for the better. Friends, our Bible is the holy, inspired word of the Lord. There is no doubt. And we simply can't toss out the parts that we don't like. But in the end, we don't worship the Lord. We worship the Savior. The Savior who has set for us an example of how to faithfully study and apply God's word. Savior who told us and showed us over and over again what our main thing is. And our job as people of God is to keep that main thing, the heart of the gospel, our main we do thank you for your holy word to us and for the word incarnate Jesus Christ as we seek to live by your word may we be strengthened by you to practice what matters most goodness justice and mercy we pray in your holy name